Well, I'm uh, actually delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, as Elena said, I have been, Joanne said, I've been working in the field for probably the last five years. And um, almost from the day I started, I had more questions than answers. And I said, we've got to have a, we've got to have a workshop with people who are thinking about these things. Because, I, for instance, we spent a year thinking about how to control for BMI in our analysis. And we went back and forth and all the different methods. And so um, I've been talking to Joanne in my program project program project manager project project director and so um, the need for this workshop was really uh, there and um, I'm so so delighted that it finally came to fruition but um, really we need to give a big thanks to Joanne Elena for pulling all this together and I know she acknowledged her staff but it was really her pushing it through and, and realizing the import of this. And so I, I really thank you for that. And I look forward to, as she said, the talks are going to be fantastic. Um, I'm here to learn as much as I give. And um, I think the discussions are going to be really the rich part of it. So. OK, so I was asked to talk about the evidence of the import of sarcopenia and other measures of body composition. <laughs> Excuse me, I've got a little of a um, in cancer survivors. And um, I always like to start, I'm going to put my glasses on. I always like to start kind of where I started in this field. And so I have a breast cancer survivor cohort called the LACE cohort. And I would say back in 2008, I published a paper that was looking at weight change. And what I found in this paper is that, in fact, People who lost weight had the highest risk. And people who were gaining weight really didn't have an increased risk. So I was kind of puzzled by it, and I kind of sat with it. And everybody said to me, oh, that's reverse causation. Don't pay any attention to that. Those people are ill. And so then in uh, 2010, another paper came out. Um, my colleague, Xiao Xu, who I think should be here today. Um, oh, on the web. OK. Um, and her colleagues in uh, the Shanghai Breast Cancer Study also came out with a paper that showed that there was a, does this work, the, the pointer? Is the pointer working? So which one? This one. Yeah. Okay, sorry. And it came out with a study um, also demonstrating that, in fact, you see an increased risk with weight loss. She, in fact, saw an increased risk with weight gain, but a bigger increased risk with weight loss. And then my colleague Patrick Bradshaw came out with a study in 2012, again, showing an increased risk with weight gain, a very large weight gain, but a much larger increased risk with weight loss. Around the same time, and, and Joanna uh, referred to this, was the first study by Catherine Flagel and all in JAMA 2007. And since then, other studies have come out but which really demonstrated that a BMI of, of 25 to 30, and if you look at specifically cancer deaths, were in some cases protective, but certainly didn't increase the risk. And in fact, a BMI of 30 to 35 and greater than 35 also didn't seem to significantly increase the risk. So I started thinking, OK, so I'm seeing that weight loss is a bigger risk factor than weight gain, that um, we're now seeing that, you know, uh, Overweight and obesity doesn't increase the risk. So what's kind of going on? And I was at a conference and sitting on a panel with someone who's now become a very close co colleague of mine who'll speak later today, Dr. Carla Prado. And she said, well, have you ever considered sarcopenia? I was telling her about my data. I said, sarcopenia? No, like, we're all talking about adiposity. That's all anybody cares about. You know, we haven't talked about muscle. And so, she said, well, you should consider that. And so if you go back to the literature and you look and do a PubMed search until 2000, September of 2009, what you in fact see is very few people were studying sarcopenia and cancer at this time. Um, just a couple of papers each, each year were published. And then in 2009, the very first paper came out on using computerized tomography scans to actually measure muscle and measure sarcopenia. 
and my colleague Vicki Barakos was one of the authors in this paper, and they showed that sarcopenia does exist in overweight and obese patients, and it is an adverse outcome, prognostic outcome in pancreatic cancer. So then we move on to past 2009, and what happens is we see that, in fact, the study of sarcopenia in cancer, and this is up until the present 2017, has become a rapidly emerging area of cancer study, especially in these cancers that we're able to, uh, that, that people have scans in, and so they're able to use scans. But you can see in 2016 alone, it was 163 papers. And even now, we're not finished with 2017, we have 132 papers. Okay, why muscle? Well, and some of this may be a review for some of you, but we know that skeletal muscle is important because it's the most abundant tissue in the body. And in healthy people, it's probably up to about 40% of body mass. We know that skeletal muscle secretes hundreds of myokine peptides that influence insulin sensitivity, inflammation, immune function, adipose tissue oxidation, and whole body metabolism, and also helps to regulate anabolism and catabolism. Muscle depletion in cancer is not just a mechanical functional loss, but it's actually a major cause of whole body metabolic impairment and in turn responsible for negative outcomes. When you look at some of the um, When you look at some of the proposed mechanisms of skeletal muscle and wasting, and this is one that we've adapted from an article in um, uh, Reviews of Clinical Oncology, um, you can see on the upper right-hand side is that there's cancer-related myopenia. Um, starts with the host, which could have you know, some altered eating, such as anorexia or dysphagia, which could lead to decreased protein intake. But more importantly, the tumor releases pro-inflammatory cytokines, which lead to increased protein degradation and um, decreased protein synthesis. And then think about the cancer-related decrease in physical activity. Very often, people get surgery that leads to, you know, seven to ten days of bed rest, which people then um, lose their ability to decrease new protein. And then, if you look at chemotherapy-induced sarcopenia through chemotherapy, what we know is that we see decreases in signaling and the mTOR pathways and the other pathways that lead to impair muscle cell proliferation and also decreased protein synthesis. Well, also, what about where you come into it? The average age of the uh, cancer, um, a person diagnosed with cancer, is in the older age. And so, um, they come in perhaps with pre-existing sarcopenia due to aging, due to comorbidities, due to, due to reduced physical activity, and in fact, um, some have pre-genetic um, disposition to having sarcopenia. So all of these things, I think, contribute to um, the skeletal muscle and wasting uh, that we see in cancer. So the framework. Um, this is a, a something I've adapted from, or I've taken straight from Anchor and all, but um, it's it's very interesting. In, in the last several years, I'm saying, what do we call this? Do we call this sarcopenia? Do we call this muscle loss? Do we call this muscle wasting? And I thought I went to a conference in Barcelona um, in the aging, you know, in the frailty group and the aging group, and they're still arguing about what to call it. There's still discussions there about what to call it. And I thought they were well set until like studying this field and that we were going to learn from them. But um, this is a framework that has been proposed by Anchor and all for the classification of muscle wasting disease and suggests that you first um, classify it as to whether it's acute or chronic. And then you go by the etiology, which is uh, due to cancer here. And then you go down to the classification by disease severity and progression. And you can see here that the, the mild muscle wasting disease and the moderate muscle wasting disease do not have to include frailty. They can, but they do not. And so it's likely, you know, a clinician seeing someone may, in fact, it may be a cult to them. It may be a cult disease. And it's not until you get to the severe muscle wasting disease that people um, think it's associated with cachexia, which is then associated with weight loss and fat loss. Okay, 
So I've been asked to do this evidence for sarcopenia and visceral adiposity and, and survival. And so I have to start with some caveats. So for those of you who might be skeptics in the audience, I have to kind of set out right here what, I, what I've done to kind of look at this literature. So one thing, because as Joanne uh, pointed out, this literature is really in its infancy. And I showed you, um, you know, there's not really been a lot um, done except in the last several years. And so there's not been a lot of consensus on the kinds of measures that we use in these studies. And the people who have studied cachexia are way ahead of us, and they do have consensus about some things, but not, um, not in this field, in the field of epidemiology, and people who are interested in you know, early stage disease. So we've, these studies include a lot of different measures of both muscle and um, visceral adiposity. And they also include a lot of different studies in the way that they've controlled for potential confounding. So the strength of each of these studies across these studies varies tremendously. But I wanted to give you the totality of what was out there, the totality of the literature. We're including both metastatic and non-metastatic cancers. Um, most of the studies measured people at uh, body composition at diagnosis. And then um, it was very interesting. A lot of the studies, or several of the studies, um, did kaplan meier curves, and they were null, and they never went on to multivariate analysis. But we felt like we needed to include them, because if we only included the positive studies, that would seem like a biased review of the literature. And so what we decided to do with these null studies is we decided to include them as a 1.0 hazard ratio with no confidence interval. So you'll see that they'll be represented there. Um, we also wanted to give you, and I'm not going to get into this because other people hopefully will talk about this, but to give you an idea of the different measures that were used in these different studies. And very few use DEXA, but when they do, they use um, uh, appendicular skeletal mass index cutoff to define sarcopenia. Um, and then most of the studies here use CT-based, and you can see the different methods that they use either at the L3 or the L4 or the psoas area, and the visceral adipose tissue methods, they look at them in, in many different ways. And, and we'll talk more about that later. Okay, so for those of you, many of you have seen this slide, and it's, you know, I probably, it's an adapt adaptation of someone that, something that I probably took from Carla or someone else. But um, it's a slide that's been flo floating around in a lot of our um, talks in this field. And I wanted to give you an idea, since they were CT measured, is that um, basically this is how um, we're able to define and quantify the different amounts of uh, adipose tissue and skeletal muscle tissue. Um, and you can see here that on the right-hand side that they take a single slice at the L3, and that's kind of right below the belly button. And what we're able to do, based on the density of the tissues and the Hounsfield units, we're able to segment out the different tissues. And so you can see here, the red is the skeletal muscle. The green is the intramuscular adipose tissue. The yellow is the visceral adipose, adipose tissue. And the blue is the subcutaneous adipose tissue. And Colleagues like Shin and Al have done a really nice job to demonstrate that, in fact, the single slice taken at the abdominal level correlates quite nicely with um, whole body tissue volume. And for adipose tissue, it's slightly below 0.9, and for skeletal muscle tissue, it's slightly above, no, excuse me, for adipose tissue, it's slightly above 0.9, and for skeletal muscle tissue, it's 0.85, slightly below. Okay, so let's go to the studies now. Let me orient you to this series of studies that we've looked and we've done it by cancer. So on the left-hand side, we'll always have sarcopenia. On the right-hand side, we'll have visceral adiposity. We have organized it such so that the studies are not by date, but they're by increasing risk of hazard ratio. When available, we chose total mortality as our outcome, but some studies did not have total mortality, and so we either used disease-free survival or recurrence-free survival. Okay, so you can see for liver cancer that there's pretty good evidence here 
that being sarcopenic increases risk. There's numerous studies, most of them are all significant. For visual adiposity, the data is not compelling at all. There's one study that shows an increased risk and one study that was uh, enough. If you go to pancreatic cancer, we see a similar pattern. Again, several studies with good evidence of significant risk of uh, that sarcopenia significantly increases the risk of um, mortality. And visceral adiposity is saying, saying that there's very few studies and not compelling evidence from any of these studies. Uh, none of them are significant. Gastric cancer, again, the same pattern. Um, sarcopenia increases the risk and visceral adiposity, there's one study that's positive and one study that's not. Uh, bladder cancer, again, a similar pattern. Sarcopenia increasing the risk, good evidence to say so, um, but absolutely no studies at all on visceral adiposity. Now we get uh, lung cancer. This was the one that surprised me. I thought we would have a lot more studies in lung cancer to actually demonstrate that sarcopenia increases the risk. And it may be perhaps that people use thoracic scans and they don't have um, abdominal scans. But half the studies here did not find an increased risk of sarcopenia on uh, risk. And then the other half seemed to show an effect. And again, no studies at all on visceral adiposity at all on lung cancer. And now we begin to see the pattern change a little bit. And here you can see for renal cell cancer that, in fact, um, about half and half that, that some of the studies show an increased risk of sarcopenia and some do not. But what's really different about here is that four out of the five studies show a protective effect of visceral adiposity in renal cancer. And the one study that shows an increased effect of visceral adiposity is only showing the effect in the uh, veg targeted group, but not in the cytokine. So it's the first evidence that we see that the effects of adiposity may actually differ by treatment group. And now we go on to the obesity-related um, cancers. And I would say that colorectal cancer has the most evidence in both areas. That is the one study that people have um, studied sarcopenia a lot, and you can see the evidence is very good that sarcopenia does increase the risk. We can also see the evidence is pretty good that visceral adiposity increases the risk as well. And what's interesting here, again, is that these are two, this stage three and stage two are from the same study. They separated it out. But you see an increased risk among people of visceral adiposity among people with stage two disease, but you see a protective effect among people with stage three disease. And this is the first evidence. In, in body composition literature that it actually varies by stage. Um, we see similar things. We've seen a similar paper um, in BMI that shows the same thing, that BMI varies by stage um, in colorectal cancer. We go on to breast, very little work in breast. This last study was done with DEXA, and that was done a while ago. But um, just a couple of studies showing an increased risk and Three studies showing, um, I mean, three studies showing an increase, a couple of none, and no studies at all on visceral adiposity. Um, so that's interesting, and in a part I think because up until recently, and we're going to hear more from, you know, our colleagues like John Shepard, that DEXA really just looked at total adiposity, and people weren't able to, you know, years ago be able to use that to look at the different compartments of adiposity. And then lastly, we have ovarian cancer. And um, again, um, several of the studies are not impressive. They don't look like they increase the risk of sarcopenia, and there's one that does. And again, here we see the difference um, by treatment group. So visceral adiposity might decrease the risk, although it's not significant in the chemotherapy group, but not in the targeted group. So in summary, these studies, what can we say about them? As far as sarcopenia, we can say that most studies demonstrate an increased hazard ratio. Some were no, but none were significantly protective. 
the stronger the evidence, and I kind of describe that as greater than six significant studies, were in colorectal, liver, pancreatic, lung, bladder, and gastric cancer. There was less evidence for renal, ovarian, and breast. With regard to visceral adiposity, I would say there was strong evidence for an increased risk hazard ratio in colorectal cancer, and we had five significant studies there. There was moderate evidence for visceral adiposity being protective in renal cancer, and I know there are some folks in the audience who are studying renal cancer. Um, there was lack of evidence for pancreatic, liver, gastro, gastric, and ovarian, and absolutely no data at all for lung, breast, or bladder cancer. So that really gives us an idea right now of where some of the gaps are in research and, and where are some of the areas that we might want to go into where there's absolutely, uh, you know, uh, very little data in body composition and cancer survival. I would say that the data presented here relies more heavily on advanced cancers because they're more likely to get scans. Um, but that more studies are needed by understanding differences by treatment group and by stage. More studies are needed in early stage cancer, and more studies are needed in cancer where CTs are not routinely taken for clinical purposes. I just wanted to give you a little um, a, a slide on the evidence of the protective effect of subcutaneous adiposity on survival. Just very few studies have been done, again, in this area. And this study on the left was done at the University of Alberta, uh, Ibadi and colleagues, and it was just published recently in the British Journal of Cancer um, in 2017. And what they've demonstrated across multiple cancers is that um, having high subcutaneous adiposity did have a survival advantage. So much study done by Sammy Hamtoon in 2015 with metastatic prostate cancers again, demonstrating a survival advantage for people with high subcutaneous adiposity. I want to talk a little bit about, um, uh, just from the research that we're doing in our group, um, we have two studies, one called the, um, and Joanne had them up on the uh, list, one we call the C-scans, that stands for colorectal cancer, and one the B-scans, that stands for breast cancer. And both of those studies are to look at body composition and mortality outcomes. And what's important about these studies is they're very big sample sizes. They're probably the biggest sample sizes of any studies that have been done, and they're in non-metastatic disease. In um, colorectal, it's in uh, stage one to three, and in breast, it's stage two to three. And my collaborators on these studies are Dr. Carla Prado from the University of Al Alberta, and for the colorectal, um, Dr. Jeffrey Meyerhart from the Dana-Farber, and for the breast, Dr. Wendy Chen from the Dana-Farber. And one of the things that we did that was interesting in this study is we started to put people into body composition phenotypes. And so you can see here we have people who are low muscle alone, we have people who are high adiposity alone, we have people who are both low muscle and high adiposity, and then we called the people who were neither low muscle nor high adiposity, we called them normal. And what you can see is that we see these increased risks that are, that are almost equivalent across colorectal, across breast, and are similar for muscle and for high adiposity. So they range from about a 20 to a 30 percent increased risk for both of those um, components. And then, of course, having both, you increase your risk even slightly more. So then what we tried to do is we tried to, um, we did a histogram where we tried to plot by BMI these body phenotypes. And what you can see here is the red are people with low muscle, the yellow are people with high adiposity, the blue are people who have neither, and the green are people who have both low muscle and high adiposity. And what you can also see is that once you get below a BMI of 25, you really start to be at risk for low muscle. Once you get a BMI for sure greater than 35 and a little bit earlier in the breast cancer, maybe 32, you're really at risk for high adiposity. But the people in the normal range, the highest degree of people in the normal range are really um, 
in the overweight range. And you can see that being, having both really runs across the BMI spectrum. So colorectal cancer, the absolute highest point of it is a 26 to 28, and that is the largest percentage of normal. In breast, the highest point, which is also about 60%, um, is at 25 to 27, so that's the highest percentage of normal. We go down to the next slide, and what I'm demonstrating here is if you look at the spline curves for BMI and mortality, and this is in colorectal cancer, you see, in fact, the lowest point of the curve, so where the lowest mortality is, is right around that 26 to 28. So, in fact, body composition or the highest percentage of normals here could be explaining why we see the lowest mortality here at 26 to 28. And that is that it's, it is a sweet spot between having enough muscle to protect you, but not having enough adiposity to put you at risk. And we see, I'm not presenting it with breast, but we see a very similar relationship with breast, that the lowest part of the curve is, in fact, at 25 to 27, where we see the um, body composition being, you know, as I said, not enough, uh, not enough adiposity to put you at risk, but enough muscle to protect you. And so then I always like to, whenever I give a talk, I like to get back to where I started. You know, so I started with this trying to understand what was going on with weight loss. You know, why were these people with weight loss having an increased risk and so much more than weight gain? So now we're lucky enough to have um, some data, and, and um, one of my colleagues, um, Justin Brown, will be working on a paper on this. Um, to understand what happens with changes in body composition and weight change. And so what you can see from this is, and these are um, you know, annualized uh, changes of weight, and here is where the people who look, we, we divided them into stable, modest gain, large gain, but I want you to focus in on the modest loss and the large loss. And you can see here that people who, and modest loss is 5 to 10%, large loss is greater than 10%, and you can see, yes, people lose visceral adipose, adipose tissue, but in fact, they lose muscle area as well. And they lose, this is about one kilogram of muscle, this is about two kilograms of muscle, and they lose significant amounts of subcutaneous adipose tissue. And if we think that subcutaneous adipose tissue is protective, and here they lose more subcutaneous tissue than they do visceral tissue, we may very well have the case that the reason that we're seeing this increased risk with weight loss is that patients are losing both protective muscle and potentially protective fat. So this is something that my group has been operating on. Um, it's kind of our hypothesis um, of what we think might uh, be going on. And I need to give a shout out to my colleague, Lee Jones, who gave me the idea to, um, it's adapted from something he's done in the multiple hit hypothesis. And um, it was my kind of overview of what I think is going on with muscle loss and cancer. And so we know that in the blue line, we know that there's an age-related decline in muscle about one kilogram per year. We hypothesize that there's probably a bigger cancer-related decline in muscle. We also know that there's some level of muscle that's needed for healthy functional aging. But we actually think, or we hypothesize, that perhaps in order to have optimal cancer outcomes, you may need more muscle than that. And so what we think happens is that you get multiple hits along the way on the cancer continuum. And the first hit probably is pre-diagnosis. So the group at Dana-Farber, um, headed by Brian Wolpin and his group, have demonstrated, for instance, in pancreatic cancer. Three to five years before a diagnosis, they were able to demonstrate that, that the skeletal muscle tissue was already being used for sequestered amino acids were being sequestered out of the skeletal muscle tissue to help feed the tumor. At diagnosis, what happens is you go through a whole bunch of tests, but usually you get surgery. And that surgery, again, leads to bed rest. It leads to, um, to reduced steps. And that leads to just that kind of sedentary behavior and rest leads to significant changes in muscle and mostly related to the inability to uh, build new um, 
protein. And then treatment, we all know, is quite pro-inflammatory. And that leads, again, I said before, to our inability to, um, to probably muscle degradation and as well as the ability to um, build new muscle. And so it's somewhere along this line that where you might start out as adequate, you start to go below what you really need, the requirements are for um, optimal cancer outcomes. And again, this is a framework that we have been working under that may be possible. Then another thing we've been talking a lot about in my group is, is it sarcopenia or is it pre... I'm confused. Am I, am I done? Okay, okay. I don't, I have, this is the, we have two more slides. Okay, is it sarcopenia versus precachexia? And that's something we've been talking about a lot. Um, and both of these, you know, sarcopenia and cachexia feature the combined loss of muscle mass and muscle function. And distinguishing between the two of the two syndromes in one patient can be difficult, but it's probably a very important question because it may have implications for treatments and whether or not these conditions are reversible. Okay, this, yeah, this is an important slide. So, um, so future research. The, um, there is an absolute need for a reference population um, and using CT because one of the questions that we don't know are these people really low muscle or do they need more muscle? And there's no way that we can answer that um, without a reference population um, that's based on age, sex, and race-specific normal values. We need consensus definitions. I said that, that people are using different measures, and so we don't know if the prevalence in different populations is different because they use different cutoff points or they use different measures. And also, we don't know that the associations are different because of these different measures. So we really need to come to, and I'm really hoping that that will come out of this conference today, some consensus on um, definition. We need to think about functional measures. Should they be included? In the aging literature, they're included in the definition of sarcopenia. Should they be included here? We need to think about new measures for early stage cancers when people aren't traditionally getting CT. Is low-dose CT possible? And we need to think about measures that people can be, do repeatedly so we can look at um, changes over time, and that's for both muscle and adiposity. And then we really need to think about this visual versus subcutaneous adiposity question. How do we disentangle the effects both statistically, but how do we really understand um, the unique contributions of both of these? I'm going to end with this, and this is my last slide. Um, so in 2014, the first paper came out on the obesity paradox in cancer. And this was an editorial accompanying it. And what it said is a, nar a narrow view of optimal weight for health generates the obesity paradox. And there was a line in there that really resonated with me. And that was that the assumption that the ideal BMI range is the same for all individuals under all conditions is biologically challenging. And I think that we've really been operating on that paradigm. We've, we've taken BMI and we assume there's, you know, the right BMI and that's right for everybody, ever any disease. And, and I think it's really time to change that paradigm. And I think we need to move beyond BMI and utilize body composition whenever possible so that we can improve our risk stratification and improve our ability to personalize these treatment recommendations and interventions based on body composition phenotype. So with that, I thank you, and I have to give a big shout out to my whole group because I know it's tried to say it takes a village, but in my case, it really does take a village. I'm a real team player, and I wouldn't be able to do any of this, any of the slides I presented without this whole group. So that's my group at Kaiser Permanente and then my colleagues at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and my colleagues at the University of Alberta. And I thank you.